Hello there, and welcome to Tactical Advantage, where every view gets you plus two plus two. I'm here with Jacob, uh, a brand new player. Jacob, how you doing? Good, good. Happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We, uh, we've been friends for a good long time and have talked Star Wars and, you know, many other franchises, you know, every... Every Sunday after a new Game of Thrones episode came out, we would, you know, go grab lunch and talk about it on Monday. <laughs> Brody's is the goat. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and I was very excited when you kind of texted me out of the blue, like, hey, have you heard of this new Star Wars card game? And I said, uh, yeah, I, uh, I have more than heard of it. <laughs> I'm in pretty deep. Uh, so how long have you been playing for now? Like two weeks? Yeah, so about two weeks. Um, I've done one in-person event play just yesterday, actually, and other than that, just been doing some um, some webcam games with with you, and and just trying to learn it as as best as I can. Right on. Uh, so I think the goal today is basically just to talk through some new player questions and. Uh, maybe even sneak some advice uh, about, you know, upcoming set two and what to buy kind of stuff. If we get to that point, uh, these were some things that you said ahead of time. Hey, what if we talked about these things? And, and I thought that they were pretty sweet. Uh, so let's roll with it. You want to ask the question and I'll, yeah, uh, I'll sure. take my stab at it. So uh, with initiative, um, obviously a, a very complex system, a simple yet complex system, um, kind of like I alluded to earlier, just saying, um, I think it's very deck dependent. So what's your advice on kind of when you should be looking to sacrifice, maybe playing a lower cost card or even doing a hero action to kind of prioritize taking that initiative? It is a very good question. Uh, I think the initial impulse in most games is to get as much value as you can at all times which usually means you know letting initiative slide to your opponent if you have one more thing to do and i do think it's you know takes you from here to here to learn when taking initiative uh, is good i'll start with one of the easy ones you know if your opponent passes and they haven't played a card this turn, right? They're waiting to respond to some to something that you're going to do. Uh, if you just take initiative, the round is over, right? And it's not always good to do. So your opponent may pass. You know, if they're a control deck and you're an aggro deck, you should probably still play cards and take actions, right? But uh, if if they do that and you're the control deck, I would just grab initiative immediately having played nothing that turn and I'll draw two cards and they'll pay for it. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, another one is, uh, you know, if, if your opponent has been consistently removing your units and you've got a unit on board that you think is going to stick uh, if you have initiative, but you think that your opponent can get rid of it if they have initiative, that might be another one to claim early, right? Maybe you have a Greedo or an RGB2 in your hand that you could play, uh, but it might be worth it to grab initiative to get your uh, attack in while Dodana is still alive, for example, before he gets removed. Uh, is that helpful? Do you, do you have other specific examples in mind? Yeah, no, I think that's pretty good. Like yesterday at, at uh, the event, I was playing. Um, I'm still rocking the starter deck, so I was playing <laughs> the starter deck um, into a mono Iden, and it was just one of those things where it's like, how much can I actually do here before I get vanquished, super laser blast, uh, power of the dark side? Just the board clear was insane. So it was like trying to figure out like how can I take advantage of initiative to prevent as much of that as possible? But I, I think you did a really good job covering that. Cool. Cool. So 
Uh, yeah, this kind of ties in, I think, a little bit to that conversation we had about initiative um, and especially kind of into that type of control deck, um, like my example from yesterday's game, is what are you looking to attack units versus base? And, and again, that could be one of those things where it's very deck dependent. I'd say it's matchup dependent, right? Mm -hmm. So you've always got to know at every point, are you the player who's going to win if the game goes longer or do you need to end the game sooner right uh in magic they would call it are you the beat down or not right so if the game goes long the blue player in this in this case the item player is going to win right uh now it's not quite fair because it's a starter deck versus a deck with a bunch of legendaries in it uh but uh you know, if you're playing Sabine and your opponent's playing Boba Fett, you pretty much never want to be attacking units. You want to be attacking the base. And if you're Boba Fett and your opponent is playing Sabine, you pretty much always want to be attacking units until you've cleared their board. Uh, there are times when that switches, right? So you might start out the game thinking, oh, I've got to rush, rush, rush. And things might flip, right? Uh, and especially if you're the control player, right? You've done a good job <laughs> controlling the board. You've got to realize when you can close it out and get the win. And I've actually, I've played in games where I've missed that, right? I had the win on table and I was just in my controlling mindset of like, oh, just kill all their units. And... I ended up getting burned because he was able to sneak in a unit somehow. And uh, so, you know, pay attention to when you can close it out. Uh, but in general, you know, know in your matchup, do I need to take them out now? Or is my goal to outlast them? For sure. So resources, I think, is kind of, to me, one of my favorite parts of playing this game. I've done TCGs in the past, like Magic and like Pokemon. Um, and those games, you can really get burned by just kind of dumb luck and not being able to draw the energies or the lands or whatever. Insert name here. Um, so <laughs> with the rule set that they have in Ultimate or Unlimited, it's really cool that any card can, and can filter into that. Um, so as of kind of like played a few games and learned it. There's times where you're you're looking at your hand and you're like, all these cards are really good. Like, can I really resource one of them? So is there a kind of a slider or a, a, a set amount of turns you go before you really start debating, you know, maybe I don't put a resource down this turn? I think for a lot of decks, you know it when you build the deck. Right. So uh, if you're playing a Boba Fett yellow deck and the most expensive card in your deck is Fett's Fire Spray at six, you might just stop resourcing at six. Uh, if you're playing a Cassian deck that has a bunch of card draw, even if the most expensive card in your deck costs five, you might know, hey, I'm going to have a bunch of cards later in the game and I want to be able to play two or three of those at the same time. Uh, so I might go up to eight, right? Uh, it's also, you know, you, you can read into the matchup, right? So if you have done no damage to base and you've gotten to where you think you, you thought you were going to stop resourcing, uh, you're going to need some big turns, right? So you might keep resourcing yeah. or start collecting two cards a turn and then keep resourcing later, right? Like you need to build some incredible amount of momentum somewhere. Uh, I have had games where I've had 14 resources uh, easily and the game was not done. Uh, that's rare, right? Like that's control deck versus control deck yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of times it is, it is worth it. <laughs> Especially if you've got some card draw going and uh, you know, you can play two giant things uh, in one turn. It, it can definitely be worth it. 
Yeah. Well, you'll need those 14 resources for endless legions. So. That's right. <laughs> that'll be that'll be crazy. I can't, um, I can't wait. You know, I'm gonna have my Piet, and then I'm gonna play my Devastator after Piet, and oh man, it's gonna be fun. <laughs> that two's looking fun for sure. Um, so yeah, these next two, I, I think, kind of go in tandem. Um, of you know, when is that time that I want to bring that resource or that leader out? And then um, along with that is like, when should I be using that um, leader ability or effect? I'm not sure what the proper action. Um, uh, Cause like I, I've watched matchups with like Sabine Green where, you know, her action is doing one damage to each uh, enemy base. And when you're playing, um, the is it energy <laughs> conservation lab conversion, conversion lab. lab there we go yeah um you only have 25 so like how do you measure the worth of of damaging yourself just to get one damage counter on there and and within other leaders as well you know yeah i i would definitely not be attached to using the leader ability every round uh a lot of times especially if it costs a resource I will think of it as just kind of a smoothing effect. So if you think about like Luke or Tarkin, right, they spend a resource to get some value, you either get a shield or you get an experience token. Uh, that is phenomenal. If let's say you don't draw a good curve, right? Instead of drawing a two drop, a three drop, <laughs> a four drop and a five drop, you draw two, two drops, a four drop and a five drop, right? So on the, the turn where you go to three resources, you can play another two drop. You can put a shield on it or an experience on it or whatever. Uh, so that can help make sure that you're not missing out on value uh, and falling behind. And I'd say that's even more true in draft uh, or in sealed play. That's why Tarkin is so, so good because it's not like you have a perfectly built curve right in your deck that you just built out of three packs right and so he helps smooth things out make sure that you're getting value every round and that's awesome uh, but in a deck that you've built uh you know you've constructed you should have your curve well pretty well planned out uh, now sometimes you can be absolutely planning to use it right so you might in a loot green deck you might have an alliance dispatcher which reduces the cost of a unit that you play by one, right? So that on turn two, you can play Yoda for two and then put a shield on him, right? So it's it's cool to plan for it, but yeah, I certainly wouldn't be attached to it. Yeah. And it definitely relates back to your first question, right? <laughs> there are times, especially with Sabine, where initiative is way more important than one damage. Because if you have initiative, you can attack with your unit, maybe with a fleet lieutenant, right, for like five damage versus one damage. And if your unit gets removed, fleet lieutenant does nothing. So you've you've lost out on four damage by using Sabine's ability. Yeah, it's definitely uh, kind of one of those learning curves. And and you know the second to last question here is is kind of like when should you be putting the leader out? And and again, I think it just falls under that category of like, really just depends on the matchup. So like the, the lesson I learned yesterday during my two games was, you know, try to bait out as much as I could in terms of um, the, the board clear. And then, you know, when I felt like maybe it was safe to, to finally bring Luke out, bring Luke out. And then he draws a super laser blast. So it's it's a mute point. A mute point. So I think ninety five percent of the time you should deploy your leader the turn you can deploy your leader. <laughs> uh, if you're playing Palpatine, I think the fear of him stealing a unit can make your opponent do a bunch of terrible plays, and so a lot of times. I just won't deploy Palpatine. Like if my opponent's not playing units uh, because he doesn't want me to steal them thinking I'm going to deploy Palpatine, I'll just let him not deploy units. And, you know, if he passes, you know, I'm playing Palp. I wanted to get to this point. I'll just pass or, you know, grab initiative. Okay. And now I've got two more cards to, to bury you with, right? 
Uh, the other one is probably <coughs> uh, versus a super laser blast. Even if you know your opponent can kill your leader, uh, you know, let's say you saw their hand, you're playing Aiden, and you you know that they have a takedown, right? Uh, it's worth getting them to burn the card. But with Super Laser Blast, maybe not. If they were going to be forced to play it anyhow, <laughs> it's kind of a judgment call where, you know, if you can get enough damage in that even after their Super Laser Blast, you'll be in good shape you know, to sneak in just a couple more damage with a four a cause I believe in or a sneak attack unit or something like that. Uh, it can be worth it, but yeah, that's, that's the one time where maybe I won't deploy is if I, if I'm already ahead, I know it's coming. Uh, and maybe it's like a Krennic leader or something like that. My opponent has ramped two damage to base. Isn't going to do much. Uh, I don't have any damage on my own base to restore. I might just hold off till after the super laser blast. And then last one on the list, but as we're sitting and talking, I'm like thinking of more and more. <laughs> so um, resourcing, like, like I alluded to, it's a really cool system, but at the same time, I feel like it, turn one, I'll get like a bunch of cards that I'm like, I want to play all these at some point in the game. And then obviously there's the mulligan system. But it's like, if this is a really good hand to like kind of ramp up, but you don't have cards you want to resource, you know, how do you make that decision of like, what's, what do you target, whether it's units or events? And again, it's scenario based, but kind of look into that a little bit. I can give you definitely some rule of thumbs, right? Mm -hmm. So the easy answer is, you know, find a curve that works, right? So if you can leave a two drop, a three drop, a four drop, and a five drop in your hand, your first four turns, you'll be good, right? You won't miss on any, on any value, which is great. That usually doesn't happen. Uh, and even if you get that, you might like be resourcing a really important card in a matchup. So I did build kind of a little scenario, a little quiz, if you will. Okay. So we're playing a villain blue-green deck. And this is our opening hand. <laughs> what do you think you'd resource here? So just you know to, all these cards. Um, so Devastator, uh, Sentinel, Overwhelm, deal damage to the number of resources. Control. Okay, that's the only one that I wasn't super familiar with. But Vader, obviously, would be one of the most expensive cards. I know that one. Resupply. Uh, Childson was in the item deck yesterday, along with the the top three were so. Um. What I would do right now is Devastator would go in the resource, um, which for this deck might not be the best play, but um, and then probably resupply as well because essentially that's what it's going to be is is a resource. So you're kind of beating the spend three to put it there versus like doubling a turn, I guess. So cost benefit there. That would be my answer. It's a, it's a great answer. I like your answer. I think you missed one key piece of information, which is what are you playing against? That's right? true. So it, it totally depends what you're playing against. If you're playing against Sabine, you nailed it, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have time to resupply. And if we get to 10 resources, we win way before this, right? So you absolutely are right. Uh that might not always be the right answer. Childson can be pretty good, but we've only got two other blue cards in our hand here, right? So if I'm playing against like a Boba Fett, uh, I'm probably resourcing Childson and Devastator because I would rather ramp uh, than fall behind when he's probably going to ramp, you know, if we're up against another green deck uh vader you know it, it could be tempting to say okay keep all the low drops resource vader resource devastator but in that boba fett matchup sometimes the player that plays the most vaders wins it's not always true but uh, it certainly helps to have vader 
So I would not want to resource that, even though it's, you know, I can't play it for a few turns. Uh, I would hang on to that. The other thing is, you know, you've got Inferno four in your opening hand. We're almost definitely playing that card and that will help us find something uh, to <coughs> complete our game plan. So uh, that, that can be pretty helpful, right? So if we wanted to go the Childson route, we could filter for some more blue cards. We could resource two of the greens. Uh, so yeah, I think I think you nailed it. Uh, for two weeks in, that's pretty good. Had a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you uh, you said you were coming up with other questions. What else did you come yeah, up with? So uh, this is unrelated to any conversation we've had here, but was watching the FFG live stream today. Nice. Uh, and something I saw, and and maybe this is in the rule book, but. My common sense would say that you could only put one shield token on a card, but it looked like they had put multiple shield tokens on a card. Can you stack shield tokens? Yeah, you can have as many shields or experience as you want on something. And, and those come off in tiers, so it's not like you hit and all the shields come off. It's one at a time. Yep. On Sunday, I was playing a game against a Luke player, uh, and he got a Kanan with the Jedi lightsaber, and he played the forces with me twice and had a Luke shield on him, <laughs> and he had an Obi-Wan die. So he had six experience, three shields, uh, and he was attacking for 13. Uh, I did not win that game. <laughs> that is it's like it's one of those things where and maybe it's in the rule book and i just you know missed it but it like common sense would be like no you can only put one of these on there and then i'm watching the stream and I see the two tokens i'm like well that changes a lot of things it changes how i would have played a little bit last night against the item not <laughs> to do anything against a vanquish but i was just like that's crazy so um one question I had that you kind of brought up there a little bit is when you're playing a deck that has kind of a specific combo like the uh, Luke's lightsaber and Luke um, with the leader card or, or Vader. Um, my experience is based off the starter deck, so those are the two I know for <laughs> sure. Were those cards, the uh, upgrade cards, tied directly into that um, specific unit card? Are you always trying to use them for that if the opportunity presents itself at some point, even if you have it like turn one or turn two, and it's going to be three or four turns before you get there. Or if you have an opportunity to throw that on a different card, are you kind of looking to do that as well? So kind of like I've answered before, I'll, I'll usually have a game plan when I'm building the deck. Uh, putting Luke's lightsaber on Luke is incredibly powerful if you can get there right so you have to make it to six resources uh you have to have luke not die when you deploy him uh depending on the matchup you might need one or two other units right because if you just put luke with a lightsaber you know deploy luke they kill your other unit that you had on board you put your lightsaber on them and then they play power of the dark side, right? Like they were just trying to kill your other unit, right? So you have to, you have to be very careful when you invest that much uh, in one unit, but yeah, I mean, Luke, Luke with a lightsaber or Vader with a lightsaber <laughs> can absolutely win games. Cool. So then this comes back to a resource question and, you know, it kind of like we've talked about, it's very situational, but Kind of a rule of thumb I have is if at any point I have two of the, um, I don't know what the proper terminology is, but like Vader and the Devastator and uh, Charleston both have the little star next to their name. They're unique. Um, they're unique, yeah. Um, you can only have one out on the field at any given time. So if I'm in a position where I'm like, I have one out or I'm planning on playing one, but I have two in the hand, I might just resource one. If like the rest of the hand is good, what are your thoughts on that as a strategy? I think 95% of the time it's the right answer. Uh, so I'll give you a few answer, few scenarios where it's not, right? So in the blue green versus Boba green <coughs> or that Boba mirror match, right? Whoever plays the most Vaders wins. So it's worth hanging on to two of them. Uh, 
in some scenarios, you know, you may think your opponent has spark of rebellion and they may look at your hand and discard that really good card. Uh, so you may hang on to two of them. Or if you just know it's going to die really fast, right? So um, let's use, you know, we've got Infernal 4 on the screen. Let's use that as an example. Uh, I'm playing a game and I just happen to know maybe it's late in the game. My opponent has a bigger board than me. And I just need to get a Super Laser Blast to reset things. I don't have it. I have an Inferno 4 out. I drew another one and, you know, a different card. Well, if, as long as I can get my first Inferno 4 killed, I can use his ability to dig, you know, and to send two cards to the bottom if they're not Super Laser Blast. And I can play the new one, right? So you can kind of strategically just get rid of your own units just to play more of those good units, right? But yeah, 95% of the time, it's safe to just resource the the duplicate unique card so then i think this is probably a not so much games play specific but obviously there's a lot of like i don't know if weird's the right term but there's supply issues with this game they've they've come out they've talked about it and as like a new player it's one of those weird things where you know there's really no product to be had outside of the starter deck so what would you say for someone coming into the game brand new? Let's say they just have the starter deck. What should be their goal for looking to like build a deck? Are you just saying, you know, ride it out with the, the starter deck <laughs> two drops or, uh, you know, it obviously depends a lot on their situation, but just kind of what, what's your advice on, on how to get into the game? When it would not be to ride it out with the starter decks. Okay. Uh, the starter decks are very very good for starter decks but i i will be impressed if you you know win any tournaments with them uh and games are more fun when you win or at least mm -hmm. have a chance right for sure so i would say you know first off if you can find places that are still drafting that is a great way to build your collection mm -hmm. and kind of level the playing field right because you get the contents of three packs for sure, you might win some more. And, you know, it doesn't matter that you don't have a collection. Around me, uh, I could go to a draft twice a week still because the stores have held back product for that purpose. <laughs> and I, I don't make it that often. Uh, but I also don't need cards, right? I have a full play set of everything. So that would be the first thing I would try to do. Um, from there, you know, if... If you had a hundred bucks, I would pick up uh, a Sabine or a Leia deck. Uh, the the cards have enough overlap that you could play either leader pretty easily. Uh, probably for in the neighborhood of you know 120 bucks, you could get a good friend to send you most of the cards for free because he has extras. Uh, you know, we're all so lucky, you know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, I think that would be really, really smart. The other thing I would do is look ahead to set two. So, uh, you know, everyone has a style. <coughs> like, I have not taken an aggro deck to a tournament ever. Uh, just because, you know, it's not that they're not good, but like, I want the chance to outplay my opponent. And with aggro, the deck kind of plays itself. Uh, you know, there's still the nuances of building it and you can still make mistakes. Uh, but I'm I'm very control heavy, right? And so I might identify now uh, which cards I think I want for my play style in set two. And then maybe just pick up a few of the set one cards that are going to work really, really well for that play style. Uh, so, you know, even commons and uncommons like resupply or super laser technician, uh, things that hopefully, you know, when you're done drafting, everybody else in the draft will say, Hey, you can have my extras because you know, I don't need these. Uh, I think that's pretty common. So that's some of the advice I would give. Uh, you know, if, if you're, if you like fancy hyperspace and shiny cards, 
this doesn't work, but I don't care for them as much. So I will probably turn most of my uh, hyperspace and hyperfoils and set two into more useful cards. And I bet you could do a lot of trading where, you know, if you pull a hyperspace Poe, uh, maybe someone will trade you a Luke uh, for that from set one. They all play the same. They just look a little different, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I have not run into any issues with like people complaining about foils and decks. Uh, I think some people are a little nervous because there is like a slight bend to them. Okay. Um, that like maybe you could get yourself disqualified if you had like two specific foils in your deck. I've again, I've never had that issue. Uh, I've had foils and decks. I've had other people that have foils and decks. Uh, but yeah. Sometimes yeah. it seems like foils are a little less desirable in this game. For sure. I'm very jealous of, of your location. It seems like the community is very active. <laughs> Obviously, you're right by a metro. I'm right in between two major metros. I would think there'd be a lot, but, you know, all the stores around me uh, have kind of just sold out of product. And with that, have kind of halted a lot of events. So nearest one for me is about a 40-minute drive. Luckily, it's on the way back home from work. Okay. so that works out for me pretty well but yeah it's just interesting to kind of like be in this position where you're like man i'd love to go to like two events a week and there's just not a lot there so looking forward to set two pre-release going to be in your neck of the woods so hopefully we'll hit up a few of those and you'll walk me through drafting because i mean i get the general concepts but i haven't done it yet so well, the, the pre-release is not actually a draft. It's sealed. So you, sealed. you get six packs. Okay. Yep. Uh, plus, you'll get a Moff Gideon and a Mandalorian leader. Uh, and you build a deck out of those six packs. Okay. So is a bit a different. deck size then, I would imagine? or Yeah, you only have to put in 30 cards. Okay. Uh, you can put in more. Uh, and then you are allowed to completely switch whatever you want in your deck uh, from round to round. Like you could be like this Moff Gideon deck didn't work. I'm going to switch to a Cad Bane leader. <laughs> like it's like your whole uh, pool of cards that you open in your sealed pack as your oh, sideboard. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> nice. So then with, obviously we've seen a lot of the cards from set two. Do you think once that's released, we'll see a big drop in, you know, maybe some Vaders and some uh, Super Laser Blasts? Or do you kind of see a general, you know, bell curve of those prices kind of staying the same? It's a great question. Uh, I think that, so Vader's been coming down for a while. Mm -hmm. I think he came down even more when... Uh, we saw Maul get spoiled. So there's certainly, you know, a chance for cards to come down in price uh, if there's a replacement that, that seems like it'll make it less good. But I think there's also a chance uh, that it can go the other way. Uh, so like when I saw Rose Tico, I've, I've been testing her a little bit. Uh, she is amazing in a luke leader deck uh and right now like the luke unit uh does not go for all that much i think he's closer to 40 bucks where vader's up at 60. Uh, and i think that the two of them will kind of even out as that gets more competitive uh quill is another one i think a luke blue deck is coming that's going to be pretty amazing uh cunning's already been getting more expensive uh but with all the Cad Bane shenanigans uh, that look pretty strong. Some of the new yellow cards, uh, you know, I think that one's going to get more expensive. Palpatine's return may end up bringing Vader back up a little bit too, <laughs> you know. Somehow he returned. That's right. <laughs> Somehow he returned. So I do kind of think about like, okay, how will this new card uh, affect prices uh, when I see it come out? But Right now, you know, I think we only have half the set, so we're guessing. Poe definitely uh, helped Black 1 a little bit. I mean, that was the cheapest legendary in set 1, and uh, 
it's clear those two work together beautifully. Uh, so, you know, it hasn't gone up much, but uh, maybe a little bit. So I, th I think cards will go up and down as we get more spoilers. Perfect. I, that's pretty much all I can think of at this moment. Did you have anything that you thought I'd bring up that I didn't or extra stuff you wanted to cover? I don't really think so, man. This was awesome. Thanks for uh, thanks for hopping on. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to playing a bunch of games, uh, especially that first week of July. Uh, yeah, I bet, sure. I bet we'll make it to at least two pre-releases. That's that's uh, the hope. Hopefully, you'll open a yeah. showcase. <laughs> Knock on wood, right? Yeah, sounds awesome. Well, cool. Perfect. Well, thank Thanks you. for joining, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, this has been the tactical advantage, where every view gets you plus two, plus two. Take care. <laughs>